Welcome Mr. Kuchiwi. Welcome to Indonesia. How are you today? I am good. I am good to thank you very much. Udah sampai di sini aja selanjutnya saya nggak paham. <laughs> ya, <Yeah? laughs> thank you, thank you, Mister, thank you. <laughs> His Excellency, Minister of Administration and Bureaucratic Reform, Bapak Abdullah Azwa Anas. His Excellency, Chairman of National Civil Service Agency, Bapak Bima Haria, Wibisana. Speakers, leaders of ministries, government agencies, heads of local governments or their representatives, senior officials, national coordination meeting participants on site on Pullman Hotel building or virtually through Zoom meeting. Salamat pagi, Wilujun Engine. <laughs> it's my honor to be here to share with you the talent management practices in the Singapore Civil Service at this very special occasion at the 75th anniversary of the NCSA in a beautiful, creative city of design, Bandung, and in West Java, as I learned, that leads talent management practices in Indonesia. Um, I will start by introducing a little bit about the Public Service Division and the Singapore government as a whole. The Singapore Public Service has about 153,000 officers, uh, 16 ministries, and more than 50 statutory boards. The employees consist of about 6.2% uh, of the local resident labor force. Okay, clicking too fast. So, PSD is aiming to be a first-class public service organization for a successful and vibrant Singapore. Our purpose is to steward one trusted public service through different ways. Developing strong leaders, building future-ready organizations, promoting good governance, as well as developing engaged officers. So really the aim is to deliver excellent public services and enable effective performance. Our core values, there are three, integrity, service, excellence. So integrity means officers carrying out their duty in an incorruptible, impartial manner with high integrity. Service means always bearing in mind that we are there to serve the people of Singapore in a reasonable way, respecting and have empathy for their needs, and yet at the same time bearing in mind the needs of the nation and the people. For excellence, we focus a lot on quality as well as having officers work together across the government in a whole-of-government manner, integration and synergy.
So our operating environment has changed, very similar to what I heard earlier. We are just emerging from a pandemic and adjusting to the new norm, not just the external working environment, and also our own employees who have gotten used to working from home for a long time and now having come to come back to the office. At the same time, there's a lot of economic uncertainty because of developments in the world. And there are changing social expectations. Part of it due to the rise of social media, where citizens want to have greater participation in the decision-making process. And these are the shorter-term challenges in the long-term trends that we face in terms of climate change, in terms of cohesion in the society, and in Singapore, in terms of aging population. Last week, it was just announced that we hit a new low in the fertility rate, which is uh, no good. It's a big challenge. We place a lot of emphasis on developing our leaders. Uh, we believe that effective and high-performing leaderships are critical for the delivery of excellent services today as well as to prepare Singapore for the future. And in the process, we under, we, in recent years, we put in a lot of effort to have greater diversity in the leadership pool. As Pat Bima mentioned earlier, we are also very aware of the VUCA world getting very complex and therefore, there is no one type of leader who can serve the needs of the people. And therefore, there needs to be very deliberate effort to build diversity in skills, in competencies, and in perspectives. While we have diversity amongst the leader, it is also very important for the public service leaders to have a common purpose sharing a common identity and values, working together as one government to achieve synergy across. So the way we groom our leaders are roughly in these three stages. Uh, we call them leaders to be, leaders in training, and then senior leadership roles. The leaders to be refer to the people, the young people who join us, you know, in the first three to five years of their program. They are in what we call, in this, what we call public service leadership program in a general phase where they develop foundation leadership competencies. So in these three to five years, they will have two jobs that allow them to be in different sectors, to develop different competencies, to broaden their perspective. And it's critical, uh, these first three to five years, and whether we provide them with the job experience that they think are worthy of their talent. Otherwise, they will leave us. The competition for talent is very great. After this first phase of three to five years, there would be a selection process where they would do psychometric assessment, interviews, and on top of that, performance management commands from their supervisors. And then it will be decided which kind of leader they will become. So here there are two paths. So one path is the one in yellow you see below. It's what we call a sectorial phase. So that's, this is where leaders start to specialize. They go into a specific sector, which I will show in my next slide, and become leaders of specialists in a particular area. So this is sectoral leadership. Whereas on top, 
is what we call a multi-sectoral leadership in the administrative service, similar to the SES in Indonesia, uh, where they work across sectors and try to integrate work across to create good outcomes for the government and for the people. So this phase will bring them up to their, you know, 15, 10, 15 years until they are like in their mid 40s. And after that, some of them will join senior leadership roles where they head an agency, where they become chairman of organizations and so on. It's, I also like to emphasize that there is a porosity when it comes to senior leadership roles. So even though we have two pipelines here that I show that fit into the senior leadership roles, at the end of the day, it is about the best person for the job at that time. So some of our senior leadership roles, until today, are still not filled by the officers from these two paths. They may emerge at that time to be the best person for that job in that agency, and they will be appointed the head of that agency. So we feel that this is very important to have porosity, to not decide the career of a person very early on in the career, but rather to let the late bloomers go through the career, demonstrate their capabilities, and still have a way to lead agencies. So this is what I mentioned earlier about diversity leadership. Uh, broadly, we define the work in the Singapore public service in six sectors. There is the social sector, dealing with people, dealing with welfare. There is economic building. There is infrastructure and environment, where a lot of engineers are. Security. Central Administration, Human Resources and Finance, that's where I'm from. As well as, of late, Information and Communications Technology and Staff System. This is about being digital. So this is the newest sector that joined the five sectors only in the past five years or so. In terms of developing the leaders, we use the 70-20-10 model, uh, which actually is based on the philosophy of lifelong learning and learning anytime. Uh, experiential learning is very important to us. So we always emphasize that there is a lot of learning in the job, learning in the assignment, learning when we volunteer to take up projects where we can interact with colleagues from other departments. So projects and assignments is a big part of that learning. Uh, sometimes people may be temporarily deployed to other roles in the public service. Uh, even for those who are not in the two leadership paths that I shown earlier, Generally, the officers, especially the younger ones, they would go for a job posting every three to five years. You know? And generally, it is accepted that going for postings, going, different, going for different exposures, gaining different competencies, putting oneself in a new situation, facing new challenges, it's an essential way to develop career. So the 70% uh, on experience. 20% of that is on relationships, which involves coaching, mentoring, interacting with others, seeking support from colleagues and supervisors. And only 10% of that, we consider it formal training. Programs in the civil service college, and so on. Because there is a limit to what we can learn 
in a three to five day program. A lot of the learning comes after that, outside the classroom. Specifically for the leaders, we have developed leadership competency frameworks to provide clarity on effective leadership behaviours, which will help leaders manage different demands. So some of these demands that we have uh, recognised is that leaders face a lot of tension. We need to do well for today, excellence, and yet at the same time, we are building to be prepared for tomorrow. That's where innovation comes in. We need to run our own organisations well, internally, and yet that's not good enough because we need to manage our external stakeholders. For the leaders at the head of agency level, it is not just about looking at the mission and vision of the agency, but how to collaborate with other agency heads to bring about the best outcomes for the people and for the country. So there is always this tension and polarity which we try to capture in the competencies of senior leaders. So just to give more detail, of the leadership competency framework that we use. Uh, it is basically what we call their five framework components. The first component is what we call a role-specific component that deals with the tension of managing well today and innovating tomorrow, taking care of business insight, and managing the expectations outside. So think of it of a, like a two-by-two two quadrant. And for the senior leaders, the outside consists of different layers, outside the agency with other agency heads, and then beyond that, working as a whole of government. The second framework component is what we call people culture. People culture recognizes that it is not just good enough to be able to provide clear guidance to the staff to help them to perform, but yet at the same time, we have to grow them. We have to nurture their capability. So again, it is not just about helping them perform today, but also growing them into leaders for tomorrow. The third part, stakeholder management, it's a lot about building social capital and uphold public trust. Okay? Uh, so it's not just about just leveraging on social capital that we already have, but also proactively building new ones, making new friends, build more networks, and in the process, building trust with the public and with the world, which is very important for Singapore. The f number four and number five are usually not the ones that uh, uh, commercial competency framework talk about. We develop this competency framework in-house. So number four is about self-management. It's about how, as leaders, we learn to be better leaders within us. So there are five levels of energy where we take care of our physiology, how we discipline ourselves, how we think, and our value system. So that's the self-management part. Uh, another part of the competency uh, framework is what we call the red flags. So this part, we think, is the, from experience, is the most interesting part. Because the red flag, instead of talking about good behaviours for leaders, it talk about some bad behaviours that leaders can demonstrate. So, to give you an example of the red flag, one of them is kicking the can down the road. So, you know, this is a problem too big for me to solve. Let's kick it down the road and let someone else in the future solve the problem because it's too risky for me. 
So this is one example of the red flag, uh, which in the past only exists in the gossips of staff, but now we have codified it. It's in a competency framework. And the whole competency framework, we put in a 360 degree feedback assessment. So the supervisor, the peers, and the staff actually will give feedback to the bosses according to these behaviors. There are about 90 items in the framework. And And we use this uh, 360 data in many ways. The one way is that the leaders who go through the 360 will get their own report to follow up. What are their strengths? What are the areas they, that they should grow? And then we also put the 360 reports together to provide the agency head with an overview of the collective competency strengths and growth areas in the agency. When we, ha when we put 360 information together, what is very interesting to us is that we start to see the complementarity between people. As leaders, there are things that we are strong at, there are things that we are not so strong at. And I think when we put the 360 information together, we start to realize in a team, how can we help each other? How can we work with each other? However, to effectively work with each other, it is not just good enough to know what each other are good at. We have to be willing to work together as a team. And there are team processes, like psychological safety, like the willingness to reach out to others, they are beyond just the individual. So we have leadership team effectiveness program to help teams, especially senior leadership teams, to be more dynamic, to be closer teams. So beyond what I talk about, we have different programs, different forums to bring the leaders together. So, just now, I just touched on briefly the leadership development pipeline. Now, I would just like to share a little about the beginning of the pipeline, which is the PSC scholarships, the Public Service Commission scholarships in Singapore. This is the main pipeline where we attract young people to join government service. So it's administered by the Singapore Public Service Commission, which is a group of very senior people from the non-government sector. It is positioned as a premier government scholarship offered at both the undergraduate, actually mostly the undergraduate level, although we also offer it at the, at the master's level. And the public service leadership program that I talked about earlier a lot of the feed into that pipeline came from the PSC scholarships. The PSC scholarships are fully funded and depending on where the students went to study, there is usually a bond that is four to six years. Okay, so on the slide is just a range of scholarships that we offer. You will notice that in public administration, there is this scholarship called Public Administration Sustainability, uh, which reflects our resolve to deal with climate issues. Uh, this scholarship was just started two years ago. And then we have the professional services one, as, long, as well as the uniform service ones. Very quickly, the selection process. There are many experts on uh, selection here, I'm aware. Uh, there is an online application where people put in their form and then they do some very quick psychometric tests followed by a more intense assessment where they come in, they do tests and then there will be interviews by psychologists uh, subsequently interviewed by the Public Service Commission members before they are uh, awarded to the scholarship. It's highly competitive. In 2022, we have more than 2,000 applications from students. Uh, 
about 10%, slightly more than 10% were shortlisted, and eventually only 56 were awarded the scholarships. And they usually go to different universities uh, to study. So as they are studying, we don't leave them alone. So before they go for their studies, there is a prep course of two weeks to make sure that they understand it is not, this is not just a free pass to an overseas education, but the responsibilities that are on their shoulder. Uh, so they learn, they start to learn things about governance, they start to learn things about the uniqueness of the Singapore uh, politics and the kind of survival challenges that we face. And then, during mid-course, as they are halfway through their university studies, we'll bring them back, and then they'll go through a program at the Civil Service College. They will go for attachment at government agencies to learn about the actual work before they reconvene for about half a day to discuss with each other what they learn. So really, at the end of the day, these are our three aims. We send them to different countries and hope that that's the beginning of, them de of developing them as leaders with global, global perspectives. Uh, for many of them, if they go through one country to do their undergrad, they will have an opportunity to do a master's degree in another country so that they gain two different cultural perspectives. They also have opportunities to do internships. So during their short summer breaks, we'll actually work with private sector companies to let them go for short internships so that they learn how the private sector works, as well as attachments to government agencies like what I mentioned just now. And uh, in the whole process, digital skills digital readiness is highly emphasized. So a lot of them actually do their attachments in companies like Shopee, Google, and so on. The President's Scholarship is an additional layer of scholarship that's really given to the best amongst the best. So amongst the 56 that I mentioned just now, some of them will be awarded the scholarship. In the past, 20 years or so, every year we have two to five uh, awarded to uh, these uh, uh, scholarship holders. And typically, they come back, they will serve, and many of them eventually became heads of organizations or even heads of the civil service. I think that's all I have to share. Hopefully, it's uh, useful, and I'll be happy to catch up with you outside. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kochi, for sharing your experience as director at Singapore Public Service of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Siap. Itu adalah 